Well, good morning. Welcome to Severn Christian Church. Uh, my name is Colin. I'm going to be preaching today. Uh, if you are new or uh, this is your first time here, we are glad that you are with us. Uh, if you want to take the connection card that is in front of you, and the seat in front of you, fill that out and take it back to the Welcome Center in the foyer. Uh, there will be a gift for you, and then the church will also donate to the Samaritan Woman, which is a local organization that helps combat uh, sex trafficking and sex slavery here in the local area. Uh, so today, we are going to be in the book of Matthew, chapter 5. So if you want to flip your Bibles open there, you can go ahead and do so. Uh, the slides are also going to be on screen if you need them. Uh, we are going to be looking at the teaching of Jesus, which is arguably his most famous teaching, uh, and it's part of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, now, if you're not familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, it's this collection of Jesus' teaching that the math, the, uh, the Matthew has strategically placed uh, after Jesus begins his ministry in chapter 4. And in this sermon, we see Jesus calling out and exposing deep-rooted issues in our hearts, our minds, and our habits. And his ultimate goal is to teach people how to have healthy relationships, healthy relationships with God and healthy relationships with other people. And this is important because for Jesus, the highest ethic in his kingdom is healthy relationships. Later on in Matthew, he says, the most important command from God is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the second greatest command from God is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So for Jesus, anything that corrodes our relationships, he tries to get to the root of it, to weed it out, and to expose it. So today, we're going to look at arguably the most radical teaching of Jesus. And it has everything to do with healthy relationships, just maybe not the relationships that we want to be healthy. What am I talking about? Well, the most radical teaching of Jesus, I think, is loving your enemies. And I want to preface to say that I am standing here alongside of you, looking at how I can learn to love my enemies. I'm contemplating the teaching of Jesus. I'm not up here coming at you saying, this is how you need to do it, follow me. We should follow Jesus' example. But I am convinced that if we can internalize even a small percentage of what Jesus is trying to teach us, that it has the ability to transform our families, our communities, and the entire world. So what does it mean then to love your enemies? Well, in chapters 5, verse 38 through 42, Jesus teaches on the rejection of retaliation. And the Gospel of Luke actually combines this idea of the rejection of retaliation and loving your enemies into one lesson. In Luke, he says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your coat, give him your shirt too. Now, I think oftentimes in our society, we kind of skip these words of Jesus. We read over them very quickly because we, we hear them all of the time, right? Love, love your enemies. Don't, don't hit other people back, right? And I think they lose their meaning. But I want you to put yourself in the shoes of an ancient Israelite. You are an ancient uh, fisherman, fisherwoman, fisher teenager, whatever it may be. And you make your living by going and catching fish on the sea. So it's... Monday morning, you go out and you go fishing, you catch some fish, you're on your way back to town, and you're going through the tax collector's booth, uh, as you do in Roman-occupied Palestine, and as you're counting out your fish to the tax collector, you realize you don't have enough fish to pay your taxes and to feed your family. So you look at Zacchaeus, the tax collector, and you tell him, look, man, I'm sorry, I, I can't pay. So Zacchaeus, he hops up on his booth, and he smacks you just backhand you right across the face. What do you do? As somebody who's been following Jesus, who's been hearing the words of Jesus, how do you react? Or imagine you're with your family on the Sabbath. You're having a picnic, you're at the beach, you're enjoying the nice warm weather, and then a group of Roman soldiers walk up, they drop their bags in front of you, they point their swords at you and say, you, Israelite, pick up my bags and carry it into town. What do you do? This is very common. Threatened by death, threatened by getting your kneecaps broken by the Roman soldiers, what do you do? How do you react when you're mistreated? I think this is where the false idea of this doormat belief of Jesus is wrong. The belief that Jesus was and his followers should be doormats that allow themselves to get walked all over. So when you can't pay your taxes and you get smacked, or when you're threatened at sword point to carry a Roman soldier's bag, what do you do? As somebody who's been listening to Jesus in the synagogue, 
you're trying to follow his teachings, what comes to mind on how you react? What comes to your mind now on how you would react if somebody did that to you? Well, according to Jesus, you don't whimper away and you don't submit sheepishly. Instead, in Jesus' worldview, you open up. Wow, Zacchaeus, man, you obviously are having a bad day. Do you need to get any more out? Or you say to the Roman soldier, wow, you look so tired. Can I carry your bags all the way to your doorstep? What is that? Right? That is not being sheepish. That is not submitting. That is not being reactive uh, in anger or retaliation. No, it is intentional and it is active. And according to Jesus, that is how his followers should respond to evil. And this is what Jesus calls agape. See, Jesus apparently thinks that when you're confronted with evil, the appropriate reaction isn't to do nothing. It also isn't to retaliate, but to agape in return. And this behavior, agape, it has the capability to transform all of our relationships. And nobody before Jesus and nobody since Jesus has ever taught something like this, let alone lived like it or lived by it as he did. People all over the globe since Jesus have looked at this specific teaching as a mountain in human history. And that's what we're going to look at today. So go ahead and look at chapter 5, verse 43 to 44. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So this is the sixth time that Jesus is quoting from the law or the Torah. And then he places his teachings right next to it. And he's not negating the law. Uh, he's clear that he, he didn't come to sweep it away, but to fulfill it. And Jesus' purpose is to move toward the true intention and the true purpose of the Old Testament law. Now, I want you to look at verse 33, 43. He says, you have heard it said, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. Now, in the five previous times that he's said, you've heard it said, he's quoted or paraphrased some scripture or series of scripture from the Old Testament. Do you guys know where he's alluding to from today? Leviticus 19, 18. Uh, it should be up on the screen, so let's read it. It says, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, for I am Yahweh. So that's the source of Jesus' quotation. Do you guys see the problem, though? Does it match up with what Jesus said or what Jesus quoted? What's missing? What is it? Hate your enemy, right? Where does Jesus get this idea of hating your enemy? It's not in the scripture he quotes. You can search the entire law, the entire Old Testament, and you won't find any laws or scriptures that tell you to hate your enemy. Now, there may be stories of people that hate their enemies, but they aren't moral examples or commands for us to follow. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, you have read, he doesn't say you have read in the scriptures. He says, you have heard that it's said. So what he's doing here is Jesus is referring to the way that this verse in Leviticus has been read, understood, and taught in his day. He's alluding to this big debate that was raging in Jesus' day about the idea of loving your neighbor, right? Because think about it. If the idea is, if the teaching is to love your neighbor as yourself, what's the question that comes to mind when you hear that? Who's my neighbor? Who counts? Is that everyone? Does, does Zacchaeus count? What about the Roman soldiers, right? He doesn't live next to me. He's not my neighbor. Who counts as my neighbor? Well, if you ever have a question about something in the Bible and you're not sure what it's saying, what should you do? Hit pause and remember, oh yeah, the Bible's not a collection of one-off verses, but it's a collection of literary works that tell one major story, and you should always read it in the context that the story is trying to tell. So let's do that. Let's read Leviticus 19, where Jesus gets his quotation from, in context. It says, You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor nor to the rich, but you are to judge your neighbor fairly. You shall not go about as a slanderer among your people, and you're not to act against the life of another community member. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. You may surely reprove your neighbor, but shall not incur sin because of him. 
You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, for I am the Lord. All right, so looking at this verse in context, who is your neighbor? Well, you have your people, which would be your community members. You have fellow countrymen, and you have the sons of your people. So let's put it in context, right? We have Jesus, a Jewish man, teaching Jewish people, quoting Yahweh, the Lord, who's giving instructions to Israelites who are on Mount Sinai how to live together as a nation and as a community. So, in context, who's my neighbor? Jewish people. A Jewish person. So, in the immediate setting, maybe it looks like the Roman soldier doesn't really count. And maybe even Zacchaeus, sure, he's a Jew, but he's a traitor, right? He sold the farm, and now he's working for the Romans who are oppressing us. Certainly, he doesn't count as my neighbor. But I think Jesus, he pays attention to the entire context. See, let's keep reading in that same chapter in verses 33 through 34. It says, When an immigrant resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress them. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as the citizen among you. You shall love them as yourself, for you also were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Okay, so who then are the Jews called to love here? We have Israelites early on in the chapter, but now who do we have? We have immigrants, non-Israelites who've moved to Israel for work, for opportunity, maybe a safe haven from war or famine. And Yahweh says that Israel is to be the, a place that is full of welcome and hospitality for people who are not part of the tribe, who are not like them, who are different. These outsiders are, are to be welcomed and brought into the community as if they were an Israelite. Yahweh uses the same phrasing when he's talking about loving the immigrants and the aliens as he does your fellow Israelites. Love them as you love yourself. Now, in this raging debate that was going on, many rabbis appealed to these verses, and they said, yes, this covers a lot, a lot of people. But Roman soldiers still don't count. The Roman soldier's not an immigrant. He didn't come here for work. He came here to break your knees if you didn't pay your taxes and obey the Roman laws. Well, Zacchaeus, I mean, he is a traitor, right? He sold out. And this is the debate. Do you guys see what's going on here? There's this constant ebb and flow, this struggle of who am I supposed to love? And this is more than just of historical interest. See, Jesus' people have been living under oppressive military dictators for almost three times longer than America's even existed. For over 600 years, they lived under Assyria, Babylon, and now the Romans. So for a persecuted religious, ethnic minority, these are burning questions. Who counts? Who is my neighbor? Who do I love? If God has called me to love my neighbor, who counts? So in this teaching, Jesus picks up Leviticus 19 and he expands it to its true intention. And he says, it's not just me and loyalty to my tribe. It's not just loyalty to people outside who come in peacefully. Jesus says that the love God is commanding is a love without cultural, socioeconomic, tribal, sports team boundaries. It's a love not only for your friends or nice people that you don't know, but your enemies, people who've come to do harm. It's a love for people not only inside your community, but for those outside, for those who hate you. Now, where does Jesus get that idea? See, you can read all of the Leviticus 19, and you won't find that idea there. Jesus apparently gets this from two places. The first is weather patterns. Look at what Jesus says in verse 44 and 45. He says, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. Now, these are not entrance to heaven requirements. See, for those of us that are followers of Jesus, the Father is already our Father. What this is, this is about becoming, living, and reflecting the character traits of God that are revealed in Jesus. So then, 
how do we know what God is like? Well, according to Jesus, he says you should look at the weather, right? Of course, sage master Jesus, that's something he would do. Who else would think to look at the weather to come up with a justification for God? And look at verse 45. He says, he makes his son, this is God, rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. Now, I know I used to, I think you may too, look over this line and go, all right, yeah, God's, God's a pretty cool dude, right? He makes sure there's everybody gets sunshine and rain. But I think we need to pause and reflect on this because this is Jesus' justification for loving your enemies. At some point, Jesus took notice of how things worked in the world. He noticed that you can't drive through farm country, notice a big house, a beautiful yard, a bunch of horses, a chicken shed, a big green tractor, and say, that person is a friend of God. And then drive and see a, a you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre looking house, a decrepit chicken, a chicken shed, a farm that can't even grow grass, and say, that person is an enemy of God. Or let's take it more home. You can't drive through Severn and see big houses and say, wow, that person's righteous. And then drive through downtown Baltimore and go, hmm, those are the bad people. In Jesus' worldview, you can't do that. He says that's bad theology. In fact, the entire book of Job is written to deconstruct that bad theology. See, Jesus observes and sees that the farmer who's honest, who's upstanding, who pays his workers fairly, he gets the same weather as the evil farmer who's a cheat, a liar, pays his workers uh, poorly and is unjust and is rude to his family. Both of those people get the same life-giving rain and the same sunrise and the same sunset. And that's Jesus' view of the world. It's this God-saturated view of the world where every sunrise, every breath, every meal, friendship, laugh, it's all a gift from God. And Jesus observes people who deserve a good life and people who don't deserve a good life all getting the same weather. So Jesus says there's something in the weather that reveals God's bountiful generosity. That God's economy isn't as simple as if you have blessings, then you're good. And if you don't have blessings, then you're bad. According to Jesus, God doesn't treat people. God doesn't give his gifts to people according to how they behave. Now, I made some of you nervous. Jesus firmly believes that God will at some point in the future put all things right and will hold all humanity collectively and individually accountable for how we behave as individuals and as a society. But at this moment now, Jesus thinks and believes and says that all things are grace and generosity no matter how people behave. And Jesus draws a powerful conclusion. If this is what God is like, and if that's the God that Jesus has come to reveal, what must then the people that follow Jesus be like? Well, Jesus shows us this because we see the same generosity of his teaching lived out. Jesus lived this out by having meals, by throwing parties for public offenders one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Jesus approaches, he draws near to the tax collectors, the sex workers, the societal outcasts, and he invites those people into his kingdom, calling them to follow him. And that's what the kingdom is. That's who the people of Jesus are supposed to be. Open-handed, boundary-breaking, generous, giving welcome invitations to share in life together with other people. And this is the first clue for us as to what agape means. See, agape in English is translated as love. But the problem is the word love in the English language is arguably one of the most unhelpful words that there is, right? Because it can mean a lot of different things, right? I love pizza, and I love Star Wars. I also love my family, right? Those are two very different things. I like pizza because it makes my tummy happy, and I like Star Wars because it makes my imagination happy. I love my family, and that's about affection and loyalty and dedication to them. But the problem is, in English, we use one word to describe both of those things. And in English, love is primarily an emotion, a feeling that happens to you. But can you see that's not what Jesus means? See, he means something very, very different. Do you have warm feelings for Zacchaeus when he smacks you? Jesus isn't asking you to generate warm feelings for Zacchaeus 
when he backhands you. And when we talk about agape, we're talking about an attitude and a mindset and then an action that flows from that mindset that we choose to have. See, God has chosen to perform acts of kindness and generosity towards people regardless of how they behave. God has chosen to agape the world. And again, in Jesus' teaching, he isn't asking you to generate false feelings or warm fuzzies for your enemies. What Jesus, as Jesus is asking you to do is he's asking you to view and to treat people, specifically your enemies, a specific way. And that way is the way that God views and treats that person. See, in God's economy, that person is a human being. They are made in the image of God. They are someone whom God loves. Sure, they may be screwed up in different ways than you and I are, but nonetheless, they are made in God's image. And God has come in the person of Jesus to choose to do an act of love on their behalf. And as a disciple of Jesus, you and I, we don't have the right or the authority to treat someone as unloved whom Jesus has loved. See, according to Jesus, in his kingdom, I don't have a right to deny someone kindness and generosity. And that takes us to the second way that Jesus justifies for us to love our enemies. And he says, it's because if you only love people like you, well, how are you any different than the bad guys? And you see, we know this, right? We inherently know this. There are some things that we choose to do for people because we feel like doing it for them, right? I have this feeling for my family that I just want to do stuff for them. Now, let's you know, put myself in a better light than I should put myself in because sometimes I act on that and other times it's very clearly a choice. And Jesus recognizes this. And that's why what he says what he says in verse 46. He says, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors, the bad guys, the traders, the people who sold out the farm, don't they do the same? You see, Zacchaeus is really nice to people that he knows he's going to get a little bit of a kickback from. Look at verse 47. If you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Even those who aren't Jews do the same. Even those who are outside of the community do the same. So Jesus is saying that even people who don't have the Torah, who aren't part of God's community at the time, they're nice to one another, right? The mafia is nice to other people in the mafia. And Jesus is acknowledging that non-Jewish people, Gentiles, they can be pretty decent people. See, Jesus apparently affirms and believes that humans in general, when we're in our little circles, when we're inside of our tribe, we can be pretty good people. It's not hard for us to do acts of kindness to and for people that are like us, who are in our family, our religious tribe, or our social, our social niche tribe. We all behave pretty well. And Jesus says that's not the issue. The issue is that we love people in our tribe and we hate those outside of our tribes. We're good when we're with our group of people, but man, we're fickle, we're selective, and we're ultimately selfish with our own love. Think about it. When you walked in this morning, you naturally gravitated towards people that you know are going to give you some warm love back, right? You're going to go say hi to the person who's going to say hi back, who's gonna, who you know is going to give you a little bit of emotional kickback. That's not a bad thing. Don't think I'm condemning you for that. That's how we naturally operate, and that is a good thing. But Jesus is trying to uncover how self-centered that process can be, not that it is. Jesus is, Jesus is trying to teach that the kingdom is more than a, a good old boys club of alike and similar people who love one another and hate people that are outside of our tribe. Jesus is saying that people who follow him, that his kingdom is more than a group of people that operate how human communities already operate. But it's a kingdom of people that reflect their father who is in heaven. And that's what Jesus means in verse 48 when he says, be perfect therefore as your heavenly father is perfect. I think a lot of us, we read that and we get disheartened because I'm not perfect. How, how am I ever going to be perfect? But I think the word perfect here is unhelpful. I want you to substitute the word mature. And this word is used to describe a completion point. It's like hitting adulthood. 
And this is both a command of Jesus and also a promise. It's not a requirement to be blameless, but it's a call to move towards a way of existing. You see, there's something about when a human being intentionally steps over some sort of relational divide, some boundary tribal line, and performs an act of agape. There's something otherworldly when someone chooses an attitude and then performs an action of concrete benevolence to someone who's outside of their circle, much less for someone who hates you and maybe you don't particularly like either. You see, when we go against every grain of what it feels natural to be human and to look at compassion and perform, look at people with compassion and perform an act of generosity, Jesus says, you are never more like God than when you do that. When we choose to view another human being with dignity, regardless of their behavior, what they've done to others or to us, and perform an act of kindness and generosity towards them, we are participating in the very heartbeat of God. So Jesus, he takes this and he plants this mountain in human history of conversation about what it means to be human. And it's the hardest thing that we, you and I, are ever going to do. But it's the most important. And when followers of Jesus do this, they live this out, something happens and it makes a true impact. When we think about the disciples of Jesus who made the most deep and the most significant impact, they are often people who've chosen this specific course of teaching and way of living. And they've oftentimes ended up just like Jesus themselves. Now, in our culture, there's still an icon in our society that we look towards, and we name streets after him. We saw everything, he saw that everything he was doing was derived out of this command of Jesus right here. Who am I talking about? Martin Luther King. Uh, On the screen you'll see one of the most impactful photos, I think, of Martin Luther King that maybe exists. Uh, It was a day in 1963, uh, someone goes and they burn cross, which is a symbol of defeat over evil, and they use it for evil uh, in his front yard. So he gets up, he wakes up, puts on his best suit, and he goes out because, you know, the media is there waiting for him to see how he's going to react. And what does he do? He picks up the cross, and he prays for the people that did it. Now, he wasn't a perfect person. We all know that. We all have our own flaws, so uh, remove the log from your own eye. But it's clear that Martin Luther King saw everything he was doing as deriving out of this teaching of Jesus. Listen to his words when he says, The ultimate weakness of violence is that it is a descending spiral, begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Instead of, instead of diminishing evil, it multiplies it. Through violence, you may murder the liar, but you cannot murder the lie, nor establish the truth. Through violence, you murder the hater, but you do not murder hate. In fact, violence merely increases hate. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Martin Luther King didn't come up with that on his own. He got that from the teaching of Jesus. And not only the teaching of Jesus, but the actions of Jesus. Paul in Romans 5 describes the agape love of Jesus like this when he says, God proves his love for us and that when we were sinners, Christ died for us. When we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. And having been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. So there it is. I mean, that's, that's the teaching of Jesus. I don't know what you need and what you, how, how you have to take this and internalize this. Um, but, you know, the holidays are coming up. And maybe there's somebody at your family gathering that you don't particularly like and you don't get along with. And maybe they don't particularly like you. And I'm not telling you, not commanding you. I'm just presenting here to you the idea, love your enemies. God.